The University of the Philippines Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hashtag COVID is Airborne, Understanding and Implementing the Paradigm Shift, a two-part webinar discussing the history and science of airborne virus transmission and protection against airborne COVID admission transmissions. I am Dr. Paolo Victor Medina, Assistant Professor at the College of Medicine, University of the Philippines, Manila, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. Um, before we start, we would like to remind everyone to, it, of the house rules to be observed during the entire press conference and to please settle down as we will begin our webinar shortly.
Good morning once again to everyone attending the webinar and welcome to Hashtag COVID is Airborne, Understanding and Implementing the Paradigm Shift, a two-part webinar discussing the history and science of airborne virus transmission and protection against COVID transmissions. Again, I am Dr. Paolo Victor Medina, Assistant Professor at the College of Medicine, University of the Philippines, Manila, and I have the privilege of being your moderator for this webinar. We welcome our esteemed guests and participants from different sectors and industries this morning, science and technology, medical and allied sciences, environmental, education, government agencies, the general Filipino public, and other sectors. In late 2021, the World Health Organization officially acknowledged the overwhelming evidence suggesting that COVID-19 is transmitted through aerosols. This two-part workshop aims to detail the paradigm shift and its implications not only to medical professionals who are accustomed to the old theory of droplet transmissions, but also to the general public. The first part of the webinar will discuss the science and history behind airborne transmissions, how these were seemingly ignored over the past century and at the onset of the pandemic. And it also aims, most importantly, to focus on equipping medical professionals and other stakeholders with the necessary tools to adapt to the paradigm shift. With that being said, I am pretty sure that like me, I'm sorry if I'm a bundle of nerves right now, I'm very excited to meet our distinguished speaker for the webinar. Uh, and in this case, I have the privilege again to introduce our guest speaker. Our speaker for the morning is a professor of chemistry at the University of Colorado Boulder, and he obtained his PhD in mechanical engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1999. During the COVID-19 pandemic, our speaker was one of the experts who signed an open letter to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization, urging them to acknowledge that airborne aerosols play an important role in transmitting COVID-19. He has led numerous papers proving the airborne nature of transmission of the virus over documented super spreader events, becoming one of the most highly cited authors in 2021. Without any further ado, let us all welcome Dr. Jose Luis Jimenez. Professor Jimenez, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Lopao and, and Joshua and the university and everyone who has who has made this possible. It, it's an honor to be speaking to, to all of you today and, and that there is uh, so much interest. I think the, the message is important, so we'll, I will go to it without uh, further ado. Um, the plan is that uh, I'm gonna speak for 45 minutes and I have a timer so I don't go too long and then we'll, we'll have questions. Okay, so. I will share my screen, which you should be able to see now. And, um, and I put a link to my slides in there. They are also on, on the internet. I'll put it again at the end. You can download the slides as a PDF and it has all the links to the papers or the different studies that I will be citing. Okay, So if you wanna know more details about this and that. Um, used to say, I'm, I'm an academic. I, I do research or and teach at the University of Colorado. I don't don't sell anything. I don't have any political interests. I'm, I'm interested in the science and hopefully helping uh, save lives uh, in this pandemic. And here you have some, some links where, where there is more information. Okay. So this is the outline of what I want to talk to you today. Um, I will talk, start talking about the modes of transmission and then some key technical details of airborne transmission, which are often confused. But once you understand them, really things become clearer. What evidence do we have in favor of airborne in particular? How has the position of the World Health Organization evolved? And most of the governments have followed along with WHO in some cases with delay. And finally, why have we and still encounter so much resistance to say clearly that the virus is airborne and, that, um, and, and to say clearly what needs to be done to protect ourselves? Okay. Um, there is another webinar next week, it's February 8th on the Philippines or February 7th uh, in the US about how to protect ourselves. So things from masks, HEPA filters, ventilation, all of that will be next time. Today we're going to talk about the science um, and the history. 
and I have this um, basically the same outline at the bottom. So you can see um, kind of where we are in, in terms of the map of the talk. Also, I have slide numbers. So if you have a question and it refers to a slide in particular, you can type on your question on the slide 37, why is this this way or that way? And that, that makes it easier to, to reply. Okay. So without further ado, I'll start with the, the modes of transmission. So we're dealing with, with uh, a respiratory virus, um, although it infects other organs, transmits through the respiratory route. So basically here we have a person who's infected and the virus is present in their saliva and the respiratory fluid, which is the liquid that wets the inside of the nose, the trachea, the, the lungs. And it needs to travel through the physical world in one way or another and reach, either be breathed in by this susceptible person or, or deposit inside their eyes, nostrils or mouth, okay? So this needs to happen outside of the person who's infected in some way, right? Um, and there are mainly three ways um, to, that this is thought that, that it is possible. One is through surfaces. So this person, let's say, has touched their nose, then touched the phone, and now this other person takes the phone and later they touch the inside of their eyes, for example, and that could lead to transmission. Uh, the other two ways um, are through basically little balls of saliva or respiratory fluid, which travel through the air. And we divide them in two types, basically the big ones and the small ones, right? And in this particular field of disease transmission, the big ones are the droplets and the small ones are the aerosols. Okay? And we call them different things because they behave differently. Um, the droplets or large droplet spray is, is a spray. It's a little projectile, a little cannonball. Goes from one person to the other flying through the air very quickly. They are large enough that you can see them with the right light. And to infect, they need to hit you inside the eyes in this very small exposed part of the nostrils, even though they're falling, or inside the mouth. And then they can initiate infection. Um, they cannot be inhaled, as we will see later. Um, the aerosols or airborne transmission is, is when you inhale aerosols. So these are smaller. Something that's a projectile is falling too quickly for you to inhale it. Uh, something that you inhale is something lighter, smaller, that floats in the air, like cigarette smoke. When someone exhales some smoke, it is not a projectile and it doesn't fall to the ground. It basically stops after a little bit and then it floats in the air and it goes up or it follows the air currents. And by breathing them in, that's how we get infected. They can also deposit in the eyes, but mostly we think is inhalation, right? And, and a lot of today, um, go, uh, discusses how do we know which of the, this route is more or less important and how that has changed in the pandemic. It is not easy to determine, I mean, disease transmission in general, but especially transmission through the air is, is difficult because, you know, we get, we get symptoms days later, which of the many things and the many people we have encountered led to transmission is, is difficult to study. Okay. But there is something that we know quite well is that the Touching surfaces is, is a minor pathway at best. You know, may, maybe it's insignificant, maybe it's minor, we don't know. There are, as of today, zero proven cases of surface transmission, despite many cases, like some we'll see later with cameras, with genomics and whatever, not a single case has been caught as far as I know. There were some cases in the press, but often I think th these were airborne cases that were misinterpreted, but none of them have been published in papers. Now the CDC has a science brief already since, since late 2020 and, and it was, it's possible, but the risk is low. And if you touch a contaminated surface, you have less than one in 10,000 chance of infection that comes from their science brief. And, and there is little scientific support for routine use of disinfectants, right? I mean, this, this is very low probability. We shouldn't be disinfecting surfaces and wasting time that way. Uh, the journal Nature, said this also about a year ago and was basically yelling at the CDC and the WHO to say this more clearly. Um, you know, so washing our hands is okay, maybe for COVID, but there are other pathogens. COVID is, is not the only disease. Others that do go through hand, for example, from the fecal oral route. But we should stop wasting money and time disinfecting surfaces with hygiene theater, disinfecting shoes. I don't know exactly what they do in the Philippines, but many countries have wasted billions of dollars on, on this. Okay, so, so we, we're done with the surfaces, that's all I said. So let's talk about the droplets and the aerosols. 
So at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, WHO told us, you know, is the droplets, you know, and they had this video that you can that you can watch um, still, and and then there's basically this spray of droplets that fly through the air, hit this person and get her infected. If the person is farther, we have we have physical distance, then the droplets follow a parabolic trajectory like any good projectile, and they fall here, and then that this person is completely safe, right? And what they were interpreting is that because there was ease of infection in close proximity, it was easier to be, to be infected if you were close to someone and more difficult with more distance, that this was proof of droplets. And we will see that this is, that this is incorrect, okay? But the definition of droplets is this spray of projectiles, okay? And CDC used the same definition. This is a presentation from a higher up person in infectious diseases at the CDC to the US National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. There was a webinar, um, a workshop that, uh, that was organized and this was the position of the CDC and the, he was the official representative of the CDC. And you can again watch the video online and he says droplets are projectiles. They are limited by gravity and they fall to the ground. Airborne are aerosols and they float around and they can spread by, by air currents. Okay. Because there is more recently, there has been some, some redefinition of, of the word droplet to include aerosols. <laughs> That's part of the resistance of not emitting airborne. But historically, droplets have always been this spray of projectiles. Okay, and that's the way I will use them in this um, in this talk. Okay. So now um, you know, so if we have ease of infection in close proximity, that is not a proof of droplet or for aerosols. You know, we, we need to look at more evidence, you know. If if they really fall to the ground, then you can only inf get infected close to a person. If, if the aerosols, you will get infected more easily close to the person, um, but you won't be safe, right? Because the aerosols like this uh, tobacco aerosols, you see they are much more concentrated in the exhalation of the person. Like when you smell the garlic on someone's breath, you smell the garlic because you are inhaling the air that has left that person with very little dilution, right? On the room, it's more diluted, but if you can get infected here, like all the super spreading events, then it needs to be much more infective in close proximity. Okay. So again, some people now, and there were, there were some scientists even last week telling me, well, when infection happens close, we call that droplets. And it's like, that makes no sense. You know, how, you know, you are, have the droplets here, but how can you get infected when sharing air in a room or at long distance? In this situation, how the, are the aerosols getting there, right? The aerosols to get there, they have to be much more concentrated in close proximity. So if it's infective in a room, it's much more infective close by. And, and the fact that you get more infected when you are near is not proof of droplets. Droplets is a hypothesis, aerosols is the other. Okay. So I'm gonna go into some key technical details of airborne transmission so that we can understand things a little better. Um, first of all, um, the, aeros the, the virus is small. It's about 100 nanometers, a tenth of a micron, a micrometer. Um, you know, and this is a figure that appeared in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Society in mid-2020. And this was their idea of aerosols. So the aerosols being 0 0.2, 0 0.3 microns. Humans don't make aerosols this small. This is unrealistic. Okay. This is a more typical, what we think is a more typical respiratory aerosol. It's much bigger, you know, maybe three microns or something much bigger. And 99.9% .9 of the material is not the virus. It's mucin, sodium chloride, saliva, different things. And then there is a little bit of a virus sprinkled in. Okay. This, someone was asking about the HEPA filters or something. And it's like, people sometimes think you have to filter these tiny things, which are filtered well by HEPA filters. but. But no, you have to actually, you are fighting against bigger um, aerosols. They are still much bigger, much smaller than the droplets, but they are bigger than the virus. Okay. Now, how, what's, uh, what defines, what particle size defines this cutoff between droplets and aerosols? And is there overlap? Can a particle be a droplet and an aerosol? Well, we can go to the CDC webpage and they have a tutorial in there. And they tell us, you know, a 10 micron particle it stays in the air about eight minutes. In eight minutes, it can travel um, I don't know, several hundred meters. And if they're smaller, they stay hours. To really fall close to a person in, in seconds, something like that, a droplet needs to be 100 microns, or a particle needs to be 100 microns, right? At this size, they really fall to the ground. If they are smaller, 
the mass goes with the cube of the diameter. So as they get smaller very quickly, they start to stay in the air longer and then they behave like aerosols, right? Now, what can we inhale? You know, when we breathe in, you know, we have some flow of air so we can uh, entrain particles that are floating in the air, but something really big, you know, if there is sand falling, even if you breathe, it's not gonna get, if it's, if it's only thick sand, it's not gonna get in there, right? So this has been studied a lot and is represented in this curve. This is what, what gets um, deposited in different parts of respiratory system as a function of the diameter. This is the size of the virus, but as we said, um, really the, the respiratory aerosols are larger, right? And, you know, things up to about 100 microns can be inhaled, precisely because if they're bigger than 100 microns, they're falling too fast and you cannot bring them back in, right? So, you know, and really it's a, a little smaller than 100 microns. So basically, if it can be inhaled, it can float in the air more than, than six or 10 or 20 seconds, okay? Um, okay. Now, how far do different, when I'm speaking, I'm exhaling, maybe a few droplets. And for every droplet, there is about a thousand aerosols, right? From, from the measurements. How far are they going? So this is the distance that they go. There are different uh, calculations, models, measurements, but anyway, this is something like this. So this is how far they travel, depending what you're doing, if you are quietly breathing or if you're heavily breathing. So here, when you are talking about very small things, aerosols, basically this is the, the diameter. When things are very small, it's like the smoke. You know, it can travel quite a bit because they, you know, they, they follow the air and the air can go further away, right? Now, when they are very heavy, you know, and it's like a micro speed, they can also travel very far. It's like a projectile, right? Especially if you exhale more forcefully, right? And it can reach a couple of meters, right? Now, in between, they don't reach very far because they are, they are slowed by friction with the air and they don't have enough inertia to overcome that friction, right? So when they are when they are in this intermediate size, they basically get to stop and they st stay close to the person who has exhaled them. This is a very important concept because we said you know below 100 microns is what can be inhaled. Now what can reach another person? I'm talking to right. So this is there is many studies that sociologists do at which uh, distance do we do we talk and normally it's 0.5 to one meter is the typical conversational distance right which particle sizes can reach beyond that distance and you see it's about two to three hundred microns with this heavier breathing or talking or things like that so basically to impact another person we're talking to they need to be larger than about two hundred microns so actually aerosols that can be inhaled and droplets that can impact are disjoint. You know, they are not the same thing. You cannot say, well, you call it an aerosol, I call it a droplet. That's, that's, that doesn't make any sense. The aerosols can be inhaled. Then there is some, some dead valley, basically. And, and then there is the, the droplets, okay? So this is important. Um, now there was an error, um, a long standing error about what was the size of, uh, of these droplets and aerosols. And this is still WHO's latest scientific brief. And in this brief, they were telling us that droplets were larger than five or 10, and aerosols were smaller than five. But I just told you, it's not five, it's 100. You know? And again, the CDC told us it's 100. <laughs> you know? And if you go to a meteorological textbook where they study how rain falls, you see it's 100. To fall quickly to the ground, you need to be a hundred or larger, right? And meteorologists know about, about the rain. They don't have this wrong. Okay. Now, this is an error that was long standing. And actually Dr. Fauci admitted that it was an error. He gave a talk at Harvard and said, you know, there was some real misunderstanding. Uh, we really thought this was five microns, but this was wrong. Okay. And he said, the bottom line is that there is many more aerosols than we thought. He didn't say, but the implication is there is many fewer droplets than they thought, okay? Some people say, how can an error like this be out there in medicine for such a long time and not be discovered? They're like, well, it's not so surprising. For example, there was more than 30 years where the number of chromosomes that humans had was thought to be 48 instead of the correct 46. And that's just something about counting. You know, this stuff about the microns, whatever, is much more, um, much more confusing. Um, the, the error, I'll, I'll skip about why the error occur has to do with, with tuberculosis, but I, I see I'm, I'm, I'm going slower than I thought, okay? Okay, um, now, so I've told you, you know, what are the modes, how, 
what are the key definitions. So let's go over some of the evidence for and against the different modes. Okay? So we published this paper uh, about a year ago where we summarized 10 scientific reasons that, that were supporting airborne transmission. As, as of a year ago, the evidence was overwhelming. Really, it has been since August of 2020 that the evidence has been overwhelming. And this paper is you know, one of the most ever read in the Lancet, so it has had a big impact. And what did we say here? Well, although other routes can contribute, we believe that the airborne route is likely to be dominant. Okay? And I, I would go, I think as of today, it's probably airborne is the only important route. I think that's the way I would summarize it. But anyway, that's what we said here. So let me go over you know, a, a few examples of, of, um, of, of the type of evidence we gave in this paper. Okay? So one is long distance transmission, right? A long distance transmission is something that historically we've only been able to determine when there is no community transmission. Because you know, if you get infected with smallpox in this case, and but there is many people infected, how do you know it was long distance and it wasn't some other person you encountered that maybe, you know. So there was a famous case in 1970, and, and this was demonstrated that there was urban transmission of, of smallpox, but only because there was zero community transmission. A person arrives in Germany where there is zero cases and they infect a bunch of other people in a hospital. And then they see you know, that uh, basically uh, they put smoke in the room in the hospital where this person was and the smoke goes to all the other places where the people got infected, right? So there was no way to explain this, but except airborne infection, right? But uh, there is something that we'll come back to in the history. They say here in this paper, which is basically a report to WHO, that airborne transmission was a possibility against which all the investigators were initially prejudiced. Why would they say in an investigation that they were prejudiced against it? You know? So we'll, we'll come back to that in the, in the history. What about COVID? Well, we have a number of, of uh, very clearly documented and published um, cases of long range transmission. Long range transmission is always going to be more difficult you know, than, than transmission close by. But, but for example, in this one is in a quarantine hotel in New Zealand. All these cases tend to be the same as in the smallpox situation when you have a case that arrives and there is nobody that's infected and then other people get infected and then um, it's easier to catch. These days we also have genomics and with the genomics you can also uh, make sure that one person infected the other as has been done in these cases. And they also have cameras and they really know what people did and they didn't have other contacts. So in this particular case, there was a person that was in a room and really never had any contact with these people who arrived at a different time. But it seems that the air went under the door and up under the door and infected three of these people. Okay, and it was exactly the same genome and whatever. And you have the links here. There are other cases in Hong Kong and Australia, several in New Zealand. So it's demonstrated that there is long distance transmission. Okay, so now what about um, uh, infection in hospitals? You know, if we are using droplet precautions, you know, surgical masks and maybe uh, face shields or something like that, there shouldn't be infections if it's dominated by droplets, right? But there are uh, several papers, for example, from this group at Harvard, where they say that there was transmission uh, from asymptomatic and presymptomatic individuals in a hospital, despite the fact that they were wearing surgical masks and eye protection, right? And the link to the paper is here and, and it was the same genome and everything. So they got infected despite these protections. And another case also by, by uh, part of the same group. And they say in this hospital, they had people that were sharing a room, but, but the beds were at least five feet apart side to side, seven feet apart from the pillows. And they had a big curtain in between. So no droplets could go, no projectile could go through there. And still, you know, 40% of the people who, were, who ended up sharing a room with someone who was infected ended up getting infected, right? And they say this has to be through the air. Okay? And there is, there is another case here I don't have time to go through, but this has been documented in several studies. And again, with genomics and stuff like that. Now, probably the clearest evidence of the whole pandemic is that outdoor transmission is much lower than indoor transmission. And this is only explainable with aerosols. Okay? This is data from the early pandemic in Japan where they uh, found you know, 110 people who, had, who were infected, but by the time they found out they were infected, they had already met with others. 
right? And then they, they follow those people they had met with and they said, did they get infected or not? So out of 22 people who had met others indoors, six didn't infect them, 16 did, right? And, and you see that they infected many times, three, 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 four, nine, 12. You start to see super spreading, okay? This happened indoors. Now, outdoors you had 88 chances of so do we see super spreading? And we don't, we see that 77 didn't infect anyone. And most people infected one, the person they were talking close by, you know, exhaling, probably inhaling the exhaler. And, and in one case, you see two or three, right? So, and, and there is many studies, the chance of being infected outdoors is about 20 times less than indoors, at least. This is an indoor pandemic. Now, gravity is the same indoor and outdoor. A projectile behaves the same. The, dis the conversational distance is similar, even it's a little closer um, outdoors. So, if it was droplets, you know, should be similar infection indoor and outdoors. If it goes down 20 times, that means it's at least 95% aerosols, right? Um, what else? So we also have super spreading events. And, and these super spreading events happen at low ventilation. And WHO recognizes this and they have given ventilation guidelines and, and Japan had the three Cs to uh, avoid the close locations that were crowded and all this, right? Um, and super spreading is important. It's not to, to spreading the disease. Sometimes people say, well, super spreading is, is anecdotal. It's a minor thing. It's not important. And it's not the case. When, when this has been studied, for example, this is the first wave in Hong Kong. There were about 1,000 cases, and they tried to do contact tracing on all of them. And they find these clusters, for example, this cluster in bars where you know, a lot of people got infected there. And then they went on, some of them, to infect their families, something like that. And then you have these smaller clusters. Um, and then there are other cases, you know, it's an, another small cluster, another small cluster, and others that is just one person to another, one person to another. But notably, half of the cases, these were the cases that they could trace. Half of the cases they couldn't trace. They couldn't find that they were next to someone. You know, where do they get it? Through shared air? They didn't get it through surfaces. And if they were not in contact with anyone infected, you know, so anyway, but, but even if we ignore that, super spreading is important. And we see, it with like, for example, that Omicron restaurant in, in Norway led to 75% of the cases of Omicron in Norway. Super spreading is a major component. Okay? So now one example of super spreading is the Skagit Choir uh, that happened in the US in March of 2020. And this is a case that I, I helped investigate and we wrote a paper. And I don't have time for the details. This is not that choir. They were further apart. They already knew about COVID. They, nobody touched anyone. They had alcohol. We know the surfaces don't transmit. And they were actually very focused in the music. And the infected person was in the first row, so the droplets were not falling in anyone else. Anyway, there's a lot of evidence. And, and we wrote a lot in the paper. And the supplementary information has a lot of the details. But basically, it points very clearly to aerosols. They were singing, a lot of aerosols were going into the air, other people breathed, and 80 some percent of the, of the people present were infected. I, I, my guess is actually 100% got infected and the rest were asymptomatic, but they didn't have enough tests then. Now, this is one example, but every single super spreading event that has been investigated in detail points to aerosols. There is not a single one that you can say confidently, oh, no, no, this one's the droplets or this was the surfaces. There is zero of that, you know. So we have done a, an analysis that we published uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, where we took those cases of, of super spreading the choir and the famous restaurant in China and all of those cases. And so if we could explain them with a model of urban transmission, and we can, you know. So here you have the attack rate, what percent of the people present got infected, so from zero to 100%. And this is basically a single number that captures how risky the situation is for airborne transmission in a room. Okay? And this is what, uh, what we would expect the points to do if it was airborne transmission. And this is what the points did. They follow it pretty well. Now, if transmission was through surfaces or through large droplets or some other thing, they, they wouldn't line up with a model of airborne transmission, right? And uh, as I said, these are the famous cases, the call center, the buses in China, the school in Israel, the, the choir in, um, in the US, the meatpacking in Germany. And they all seem to uh, tell us the same story. They are, they are airborne, which is when you share the air in a room and that's when you get infected. Okay? 
So now, um, this is very useful. We have a model that tells us what happens in this situation, right? You are uh, briefing shared room error now, but we can extrapolate back to what happens here because this is basically what's different from here to there. There's just more dilution. The air has, has been mixed with more air that didn't have virus and the virus is more diluted. Okay? So this is a, a paper we, we are revising right now. Um, where we use the model, there is nothing more, use, more useful than a good theory. Um, so then uh, what we're gonna do is put the data here. We're gonna calculate what's the probability of infection of someone else. So from zero to one or hundred percent as a function of how diluted the exhaled, the exhaled air is. Okay? So this is exhaled air if you were breathing, doing mouth to mouth to someone. And then these are from measurements in the literature. When you are in close proximity, you have dilution factors of maybe 10 to a couple of hundred. And when you are in shared room air, you have from a few hundred to maybe 10 or 20,000. These are, these are typical numbers uh, from the literature, right? Now, um, so what, what do, does the model of COVID tell us that it should happen, right? So this is now for the super spreading events. And the super spreading events are caused by people who are very infected. Okay? So this tells you if in close proximity, if you meet with someone who's very infective, you have a lot of chances of being infected. Now in shared room air, there is a lot more dilution, right? And you can have attack rates, you know, between 10, 20, 80%. I mean, this is for an hour, this is for a certain condition, you could do it for other, for other conditions, but basically it is a feature, it is a law of nature of airborne transmission <laughs> that it has to be more infected in close proximity. And if you see infection in shared room air, infection in close proximity has to be much worse, right? Now, this is like a, a highly infective COVID patient, but we also have data for the average COVID um, infected person, and that's much lower. The, something that has become very clear is the variation in how much virus people exhale is enormous, okay? So this is now the median person, right? So you say the median person excels many fewer viruses and even in close proximity, your chance of getting infected is maybe only 10%. And then in shared room air is very low. Okay? Now in long range, the chance is very low. So it can happen, you know, if you, are, if you have very high dilution, more likely I think like in this case of the hotel I told you is they're just unlucky, you know, they are in this situation because the, the air was just going the wrong way without being diluted enough. Okay. So this is COVID, what about missiles? That they always tell us, oh, missiles is the most uh, transmissible um, disease. So this is what, what you will see, this will be a highly infective missiles uh, person and this will be a, a median person, you know. So missiles, if you meet a highly infective person in close proximity, you get it. In shared room air, you have a very high chance of getting, getting it. And you see, we see these very explosive outbreaks that are more explosive than, um, than with COVID. But again, the average um, person infected with measles um, is not very infective, okay? And, uh, and for 70 years, they told us it was a droplet disease because they were seeing ease of infection in close proximity. Tuberculosis is, is less contagious, oops, sorry. Um, and, and you know, so, so you see the opposite. Tuberculosis has trouble infecting in a single encounter, but people stay infected much longer. Okay, okay so, so we wrote another paper in science uh, where, we, where we summarized that um, uh, we, we went back in the literature and said, actually it's not just COVID, basically every respiratory virus or almost every respiratory virus transmits through aerosols, okay? And it, it's just that we hadn't, uh, you know, for the same historical reasons, we hadn't accepted it, okay? And this is a table from that paper. I will skip in the interest of time. Now, this is a paper from Harvard Infectious Disease Doctors, which with those of you in medicine, I'm sure it will carry more weight. And they tell us what is the traditional teaching or the current understanding. And I highly recommend this paper, but basically the traditional teaching is some diseases are only transmitted by droplets. The current understanding is that all can be transmitted by aerosols you know, the medical mass protect against droplet. The current understanding is that they decrease, but they do not eliminate transmission consistent with what I told you, you know, and so on. I, again, I'm, I'm running a little late, so I won't, I won't go in there. You can look at the slides after the fact, but basically these Harvard infectious disease doctors are telling you what are telling you what I am telling you. It's basically the same thing. Okay, okay so how has the position of WHO evolved? Okay. Um, 
Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, there was there was uh, confusion. There was some mentions of airborne, but basically, in March 28th of 2020, WHO came loud and clear and said, "It's a fact that is not airborne. It's some droplets that are too heavy to be in the air. They quickly fall, and you know, they may go on surfaces. We have to wash your hands." And they they were so certain that they said that to say that it was airborne was misinformation. Right? That's how certain they were. This is. This is not airborne to say so is misinformation, right? Now we met with them five days later and we told them, you know, this is incorrect. And, you know, anyway, that's, that would be a long, long story. They were absolutely close to our input. They didn't listen. Um, but they did say during aerosol generating procedures, that was something that was, that was mentioned there, that then you can have aerosols, right? And something else we have learned in this pandemic is that the aerosol generating procedures, which is something that came out of the first SARS, is incorrect. You know, that, what, that uh, intubation or extubation, a lot of the typical, uh, what is called aerosol generation procedures, don't generate aerosols or generate very few. What generates aerosols is talking or especially coughing or something like that. And um, these are some measurements from our paper from, from uh, Jonathan Reed. Okay. So the real aerosol generating procedures are talking, singing, uh, coughing, that kind of thing. Okay. Now, unfortunately, what we what we found is that WHO was stuck on a very old dogma. And this is, you know, I, this is kind of what I've been doing the last two years with a lot of other people is kind of trying to excavate WHO out of here. And, and um, I, you know, I, I would never thought I would be saying something like this, but this has been like that movie of Don't Look Up that, that would, uh, I don't know if it's available in the Philippines, the one about the comet that's going to hit the earth and then nobody believes the scientists and, and at the end the comet hits it. So it's, I mean, it's, it's very, I mean, I, I do feel identified with the way the scientists are being treated in there, okay? And it's really based on truly possible events, seems like a good description. Okay. So this was in March of 2020. It took until November of 2020. As I told you, the evidence was clear by August of 2020, but by November, finally, WHO started saying out of the blue that ventilation was very important. They didn't say why, you know, they didn't explain why, but they did say that ventilation was important, right? So anyway, um, they later admitted, so Maria Van Karhove, who's the, the technical lead for COVID, who's in this picture, she said in an interview in May 2021, it says, the reason we are promoting ventilation is that this virus can be airborne. But she admits avoiding the word, right? So they so they knew it can be airborne, and that's why they started saying ventilation. But they didn't say airborne, and to this day, don't say it very clearly. Now, the aerosols start appearing. So this is um, something about clinical management, and then suddenly there is a mention of aerosol. This is in January 2021. Finally, in the 30th of April of 2021, after the publication of our Time Scientific Reasons article in the Lancet, they finally say, okay, this is in aerosols and the aerosols can travel farther than one meter. It's still kind of confusing, but, but anyway, this is starting to get closer to reality. And the latest up update from the 23rd of December, finally, again, it's not perfect, but it's, but it's better. They say, you know, uh, infectious particles can pass through the air and can be inhaled at short range close to another person. And this is short range aerosols or range airborne, or in a poorly ventilated place, the aerosols accumulate, and that's what they are calling here long range aerosol. So anyway, so that they're finally saying it um, a, a little more clearly. Okay. But why did it take two years? You know, why, I mean, and, and again, the WHO is an example that has a huge influence in most places, but, but it's not, you know, um, and, and it's typical of other public health organizations, but why did it take so long? Okay. So there are a couple of reasons. Okay? The first one is you cannot understand without the history. The history is gonna be really important. And in the history, there was an error. And as I will tell you, it's an error in the physics. They confuse gravity with dilution. And it was made in a moment with a lot of change. And then it was an error that was in medicine, but was an error in the physics. And the people in medicine didn't listen to the people who knew the physics. And, and, that, and we got there to 2020. The five micron error is, is, is a subset of that error, okay? But we have to go back in history, you know? So Hippocrates in ancient Greece, or one of his disciples wrote, whenever many people get the same disease at the same time, this must be because we're breathing in something with the air, okay? 
And you know, otherwise their theories were, were not very correct, but this idea of a miasma that comes through the air and then a lot of people breathe it in and get sick, that stayed with us through, throughout history really until very recently, right? Now we have written some papers on this history that, that you can find uh, the links there and there is this popular press article that's, that's easier to read, but anyway, a lot more details. I'm gonna jump over two millennia until 1850. A lot, a lot happened in between, but basically what didn't change is a belief that diseases were going through the air, okay? And for example, cholera was one of the diseases that was believed to transmit through the air, right? But John Snow was a wealthy doctor in London and there is a cholera outbreak. And, you know, people thought again, was the air, was a miasma. But he investigates and then he says, well, there is this uh, broad street water pump where people are getting water to drink. And all the cases are around there. And there was a distant case. And then he discovers that the distant case was the mother of someone who lived around here. And the son had brought water to the mom and then the mom had died of cholera. And it was the only person who died in that part. So, you know, it was pretty convincing evidence, right? Um, and he removes the, the handle of the pump and then the epidemic stops, you know. But they don't believe him. You know, the, the health board says, oh, this is just a suggestion. And, you know, they had reasons not to believe him. I mean, it has been always hard to prove what diseases, uh, how diseases are transmitted and whatever people believe, the establishment believes is hard to change. And they, you know, and John Snow died before this was accepted, you know. But anyway, eventually it was accepted about 10, 15 years later. And, and then, you know, we realized, okay, cholera goes to water, right? And there are a couple of other cases that we discussed in the article. So purpural fever was shown by Ignat Semmelweis to go through the hands. And malaria, malaria means bad air in Italian. So it was thought to go through the air and then it's shown to transmit through mosquitoes. So basically in this graph, we see what was the dominant thinking for disease transmission. And it was, a lot of history was, you know, miasma theory, most diseases go through the air. But then around the 1850s, we started to say, well, not this one, not that one, not that one. And that's also when germ theory is proven. And, you know, that's a, a bit, there is a very big change. There is a big paradigm shift, okay? during that period. Now, at that critical time, there is someone named Charles Chapin. This is a public health official uh, in the US and uh, he was very prominent. He writes a book where he summarizes all the evidence about how different diseases transmit in light of germ theory. This was written about 30 years after germ theory had been accepted. Okay? And his theory, his preferred theory was what he called contact infection. You know, The germs come from one person to another in close proximity either because we touch or because of this spray of droplets. He is the one who first uses this idea of the spray borne transmission. Okay? Now, airborne infection is getting in his way, right? He says, we don't really have evidence, but people don't listen to me on contact infection because they think, they still think they're getting infected through the air. For example, says here, it's impossible as I know from experience to teach, pe to teach people to avoid contact infection while they are firm firmly convinced that the air is how they're getting infected, right? So he has a problem and he acknowledges in the book, but then he just decides to, to say, you know, I don't really have evidence. I, we don't really know, but we don't, since we don't have evidence, I'm gonna say that the air doesn't infect, that we can discard it and it will be a great relief to be freed from infected air that we have been fearing infected air since Hippocrates, you know, and, um, and he is really successful. You know, what happens is that Chapin who was very prominent he becomes later the president of the American Public Health Association and really becomes very, very successful. And for example, Alexander Langmuir was the founder and the first director of the epidemiology branch of the CDC in the US, someone very, very prominent, very influential. And he described Chapin in 1967 as the greatest American epidemiologist, right? And as late as the 1980s, it was really Chapin's, the CDC was Chapin's ideas, right? So really, Chapin came at the right time, changed the paradigm, and his ideas dominated, okay? And Langmuir wrote in 1951, it remains to be proved that airborne infection is an important mode of spread of any naturally occurring disease, okay? So this is when, I, when we were hearing earlier about smallpox and they were saying they were all prejudiced against airborne transmission. It's like, this was the, set, the mental setting, the, Parad uh, the paradigm shift of Chapin and, and you know, Langmuir and others. And they were like, you know, airborne infection is something very strange, very rare. Okay? And um, let's keep this for time. So basically in this graph, if we extend a little more. So the pendulum of history is like 
most of the time we have feared miasmas, but suddenly there is progress, there is research. You know, we find, well, there is gem theory. It's maybe it's not miasmas at all. Maybe this was a superstition, you know, and really infection through the air is actually very rare, you know, and that's kind of what Chapin does. And through the 50s, this is basically the thinking. Yeah. Now, finally, in the 1960s, uh, William Wells and, and, and colleagues, you know, who have spent 30 years trying to demonstrate that there are diseases that go through the air, in particular tuberculosis and measles, and, you know, nobody believed them. They accused them. They are trying to bring back the miasmas. Um, they finally achieved undeniable proof of tuberculosis transmission in 1962. Basically, they, they take the air from a tuberculosis ward where a lot of sick people were, and they bring it to infect all these guinea pigs. Okay. And then they find that they get infected about three per month. And there was another channel that was disinfected with ultraviolet light that kills the tuberculosis uh, pathogen. And none of those guinea pigs get infected, right? So this is undeniable and it is accepted, right? And uh, that's what Riley. So then finally, we, we start to go in the other direction. So tuberculosis and later in the AVs, misses and chickenpox are accepted. But, uh, but this is the period in which uh, smallpox was very resistant. There is a still very intense resistance. Diseases are accepted when they are undeniable as airborne, like missiles, super explosive, super spreading, long distance transmission, or tuberculosis, what I told you. But really it's the pandemic that has changed this paradigm and, and revealed that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Okay? And there are more diseases that are airborne. And really it's this droplet dogma of Chapin is finally sinking. And you know, like in, like in any paradigm shift as Thomas Kuhn tells us, you know, the scientists who defend a failing theory invent many changes. Now the droplets float and can be inhaled and, and, and different things that, you know, just trying to save the droplet theory. Um, okay, so, so we cannot understand the resistance without this history, but there are more reasons, you know. The history set up that, for example, the WHO committee that decided how the virus was transmitted had um, six hand washing experts and zero airborne experts for a new disease because they were so certain that airborne was not important, you know. Early on, they were also, they told us they, you know, there was not enough PPE and there was some fear of panic. So these were also reasons maybe early on, but once it has become clear, uh, it's clear also that WHO and others don't wanna lose face. And there is a government official who told me privately, we need an approach that will allow everyone to save face, you know. So they, they admit that they, they were right <laughs> and they're wrong, but they need to save face, okay. And, you know, um, anyway, so, but there, there is one other reason, which is for governments is very convenient. The, what, the beginning of the pandemic with droplets and surfaces are very convenient because all you have to do as a government is tell people what to do. Wash your hands, keep your distance, maybe wear a mask or something. If you get infected, ah, you didn't wash your hands enough. It's your fault, which is something that seems to be done a lot in, in this field. Okay? On the other hand, if it's airborne and you get infected by breathing the air in a room, you don't have the power to clean the air in, in every office, classroom, or um, uh, shop where you go. You know, the government or the, the school or whatever have a responsibility to clean the air, and that costs money and costs effort, and they want to avoid that, you know. And, and we have been told that directly, you know, that's one reason why they don't want to admit airborne. Okay? So this is my last slide, um, you know, just in time. So finally, I think we, we are in another paradigm shift. The, the, we were the, in, there was this paradigm shift of Chapin, which had many useful things, but he went too far on the airborne part and, and that has done a lot of damage. And finally, that error is being discovered. And, and we've realized that most respiratory diseases go at least partially through aerosols, right? And we have this other, this is a different paper in science where we talk about the paradigm shift. And, and any respiratory disease, any, any airborne disease, by definition, transmit best in close proximity and less well in shared room air, but it can transmit in shared room air with low ventilation. This is by definition, okay? And it's not a medical problem, it's, or it's not only a medical problem. We need to collaborate across different disciplines, right? So there is all this clinical expertise, you know, great things like vaccines, diagnostics, treatments. This is all definitely, you know, health people, doctors, whatever. But then when the virus is out of the body, this is aerosol science and engineering and ventilation and things like that. And it's not medical science and doctors are not trained in this stuff and they don't know. And when they talk about it, they make very elementary mistakes, you know, because it's something complex that they haven't studied, right? 
And we need different methods. You know, for clinical things, you need these controlled clinical trials. For this stuff, we have other things. We have, you know, we have physics and chemistry. That's how we put people on the moon. You know, we don't need to do clinical trials to put people on the moon. Now there is there is different attitudes. So this is a member, uh, Paul Hunter, who's a member of the WHO committee. And uh, when when we published one of the most uh, notable papers where we said the virus was airborne, he was basically saying we were ignorant. He said most of them are chemists, engineers, owners of ventilation companies, which we were not. But it was implying that we had some economic interests. They do not have a broad understanding of disease transmission mechanisms. These issues more nuances than they realize. So basically, and there were WHO officials who said the same thing. Basically, people like myself should shut up. We don't know about disease transmission. This is not the way. The way is what this other doctor is saying in Twitter, which is someone I, I, I recommend following. And he said already a year and a half ago, he said, I feel I'm getting a PhD in COVID. And I need to take many courses, epidemiology, virology, immunology, clinical medicine, pharmacology, aerosol science, you know, and many other things, you know. So it's not like aerosol science is, is the center, it is not, but it is a, an essential component, you know, and we need to work together. So anyway, I hope uh, to leave you with, uh, with that message and I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jimenez, uh, for that very insightful and informative talk. Uh, we will now begin um, the open forum sec uh, section of this webinar as you catch your breath, sir. Thank you very much for, again, that excellent session. Um, for the attendees who have questions, especially the ones who are raising their hands, we would like to just inform everybody that we have, I, I think, 1,400 um, attendees who are in the actual webinar aside from the the. Um, ones that we are streaming. So we might not be able to call everybody. So we would like to encourage you to write your questions in the Q&A box located on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. And to our participants watching via live stream, you may also write your questions via the comment sections of those um, um, sites and our panelists will collate them. And again, we would like to remind everyone to observe our house rules during the entire open forum. So... We will begin, and uh, again, I would like the moderating team to please help me uh, screen these questions. Uh, there are really a lot coming in, especially from multiple sources. So um, I'll try to uh, read first the questions. So Professor Jimenez, let's start with something that's a bit more practical, um, and, um, and uh, you can start answering this. There are several people who are interested. Sir, is swimming safe? And there's a bit of confusion because even if the pool is placed outside with good ventilation, participants are obviously not masked. And in line with this, is it safe to go to beaches without face masks where people are far apart with one another given the open space and good ventilation? I think let's start with a very practical, very uh, non-controversial, I suppose, question, <laughs> uh, Professor Jimenez. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, uh, as I said, outdoors, the safest, if we do only one thing, the safest thing we can do is do things outdoors. And if we do things outdoors with distance, the probability is very low of infection. So I would say, if you're on the beach and you're far from other people, it's safe. Or, uh, you know, if you are very close, if you're in one of those beaches that you're really on top of other people, then, then you know, imagine one of them is smoking. The person next to you is smoking and the, the smoke is coming to you. So you could get infected in that situation. But uh, still less likely than if you did that same thing indoors. A swimming pool, you know, if it's not very crowded, in general, I don't, I don't think it's, it's high risk. You know, you are exhaling a lot, but there is a lot of dilution. And um, I will talk next week about measuring carbon dioxide as a way to see how much exhaled air is somewhere. And, and the colleagues who have measured this in pools, they say it's pretty low. There is also chlorine in the air normally in swimming pools um, to kill the microbes and some of that evaporates. It hasn't been studied in great detail, but we suspect that 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 may also kill the virus. But but anyway, I would say that um, it's not very dangerous. It's like the, the pandemic is not a pandemic because because of swimming pools. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Jimenez. And I suppose you're not saying that we just go there, everybody goes and congregates in one area, but it's really about understanding how the virus is transmitted. Thank you very much, sir. If, if uh, I can say, if I can yeah, go say ahead, one sir. more thing. I mean, there, ahead, there, is, 
there, there is now, a, you know, thousands of super spreading events and there are databases of where super spreading happens, right? Where does it happen? In restaurants, in bars, in choirs, in schools, you know, in places where people spend a lot of time in meetings, in, in concerts, when people spend a lot of time in a box with the same air and talking, especially, or sometimes in gyms, we're exercising as well. I don't remember hearing of any outbreak in a swimming pool or in a, or in a library where people are not talking or, or in a movie theater, you know? So there are, it is well known which type of spaces are more dangerous, you know? And, and, and I don't think swimming pool is one of them, yeah. Thank you very much for that, sir. And I guess another related, very uh, practical question before we go to the more science directed ones. Um, there is a question here on the clarification on transmission regarding surfaces. Uh, in your session, you said that it is very minimal. Um, Professor Jimenez, just a very practical question. Does this mean that sharing of things such as a glass of water with infected individuals would still result in less chance of transmission? Um, okay, I, I guess if the, if I, at the extreme, if you kiss someone or if someone drinks in a glass of water and then leaves some saliva and you immediately take that glass and you drink, I mean, those, I, would say, I wouldn't say that chance is low. I mean, I think that, that that's what I mean more is that, you know, you are, you go into the school and you open a door or you touch the light switch or you, you touch a table and then you touch your eye. That, that I think is, is, is very low probability. If you really, really try, I think you could get infected through surfaces. But still, to my knowledge, none of those cases have been demonstrated. Okay. So thank you very much, sir, for those um, very good answers. And again, um, I am a medical professional. And I think those answers are also how we actually explain to patients these things. So thank you very much, sir, for the unities regarding that. Uh, Sir, just one last again for the principles of the thing for the general public. I hope we're just warming you up, sir, for the more intense questions. How about jogging outside? I know that it's, to me, as a medical professional, it's like, it's very redundant, but to the more than a thousand people here, and I suppose more than the thousands others listening, sir, is there a high chance of getting infected? Jogging outside without a mask? What, what are, what's your thought about that? I mean, I, I think it's, again, it's unlikely unless you are very close to other people. You know, if you are jogging and you're jogging in a pack of people with 20 other people and you are all close to each other and, you know, for an hour and imagine one of them is smoking and then this, and you are behind that person and the smoke is coming to you. I mean, it's possible. But now if you are alone running in the, in the park and you are never, you know, really close to other people, I think the chance is low, is very low. It's not, it's not impossible, but, but I think it's very low. It's, it's not what you should be concerned about. You know, we are all very tired. We are all very, you know, you know, as this pandemic has been such a pain, we have to put our attention on the things that are high risk and, and the things that are lower risk. We can, you know, if, if you are afraid, well, you can, you can jog with a mask, you know, you, people say, well, I can breathe less well. It's, you know, people come to Colorado because they can breathe less well to prepare for the Olympics because they, you know, we're high, so there is less oxygen. So, so you can take it as a challenge, you know. Okay. Thank you very much for that, sir. I, I think let's ease into now the more applications of the, the things that you said, and especially um, in terms of highlighting these riskier activities, Professor Jimenez. Um, let's go for this question. Uh, a question here is about Fully air-conditioned spaces. Um, in the Philippines, they're very common, the work uh, because of the climate and all that. Um, the question here is, it, it, would it be sufficient to open one or two windows for a few minutes per hour to allow for ventilation? Or would you have a recommendation as to how many minutes is actually practical and effective? And again, the, the, the person posing the question said, many office spaces and medical clinics actually in the Philippines have a oh well perception that there's poor ventilation because of these rooms. And again, for it's they're designed mainly for I think comfort. And so we would very much like to know how we can improve without sacrificing the comfort, Professor Imens. It's very important. I'm a I'm a I'm a Filipino and I really 
uh, don't enjoy the uh, hot climate. So what are your thoughts about that, sir? Yes, I, I know. I know. Um, so um, I will talk more uh, in more detail about ventilation on, on, the, on the other webinar next week, but just to say it briefly, um, normally, I mean, there is two types of air conditioning systems, the cheap ones and the expensive ones. The cheap ones are when you put a unit on a window, one of these boxes in the window, or the mini split, I guess those will be the medium cost, something like that. Both of those cool the air, but they don't exchange the air. They don't remove the virus. They just cool the air, but they keep the air in the room. That situation is dangerous in that sense because you don't have ventilation. Then you have more expensive systems that sometimes you may have in commercial centers or government buildings where there's a system with tubes and the air goes through a tube and then is filtered and comes back through another tube. Those systems often exchange some of the air. So those tend to be a little safer. They can be made a little safer. Now, um, in terms of how, if you have to open the windows, you always have this conflict of, you know, I want to open the windows, but I don't want to be hot or maybe I have mosquitoes or whatever. Now, I will, again, I will show this in more detail next time, but um, if you do the experiments, what you see is what you need to do is open the windows keep them open all the time when you're in the space, but you don't need to open them completely. So for example, a lot of colleagues did uh, experiments in the winter in places that were very cold. And then, and then what people were doing like teachers in the schools, they were opening the windows completely and then they were very cold. They were at five degrees C. So then they were closing the windows completely and opening them. So then what they found by measuring carbon dioxide is that they could open three windows, 15 centimeters. So about six or seven inches. And, and just keep them open all the time. They have three windows in different sites and that created continuous ventilation and that kept the exhaled air low, right? And at the same time they were, so instead of being at 20 degrees that they would be normally, they were at 16 degrees. So they were not as comfortable, but they were not at five degrees, right? So I would recommend something like that. And I will talk more about measuring CO2 also um, next week. Thank you very much for that, sir. And maybe just as a related question, I think there are a lot of scientists here, engineers, people who actually have the practical expertise to make these things happen. And uh, your, your inputs are very interesting. In that closed environment, uh, Professor, there's a question here. Um, and I will not pretend to understand everything that was here, but I, I'm so, I suppose you will. Uh, apart from the ventilation and airflow, will humidity, room temperature, and all of these similar factors have an effect on dilution and movement of the aerosols? Uh, like uh, the person who asked the question said, in more humid rooms, the aerosols are more concentrated. Is that correct? Do they remain suspended longer and move slower? And how do these aerosols integrate? Do they evaporate, condense, sublimate, or... Is it a combination of the above or through a mechanism that still remains to be elucidated? Thank um, you, sir. I mean, the, um, let me keep it simple. There, there, is still <laughs> a lot of, there, there is still a lot of research and a lot of details that are not very well understood, but, but to first order, we do understand. We exhale these aerosols and at the beginning, um, basically a respiratory system is at 100% humidity. So they come out with a lot of water but then they very quickly dry, right? Just like in, in a very cold day, you see this, um, this kind of aerosols that you exhale and the water condenses, but then it evaporates very quickly, right? I don't know if this happens in the Philippines, maybe it's never cold enough there, but maybe you've seen it in the movies, right? Um, so the water evaporates very quickly and the aerosols equilibrate with the humidity in the room. And the humidity is not gonna concentrate them and it's not, not gonna affect them very much unless the humidity is really, really high. If the humidity is more than 80%, you're really 90% humidity, then they will, they will fall faster to the ground, right? But on most, on most situations, they are gonna do the same. Now, um, humidity has other effects and, and it has been seen, for example, a study we collaborated in Argentina that under dry conditions, there is more transmission. And there was another paper used yesterday saying something similar. So under very dry conditions, 10%, 20%, 30% relative humidity, right? You know, it's not totally clear what the reasons are. I, I don't wanna go into the details, but, but very dry conditions are not good. And sometimes that can happen with air conditioning if you really push it to be, to be very cold. Thank you, Professor Jimenez. And in, in that subject of uh, 
transmission. Um, there's a question here that given the evidence of airborne transmission, and then you presented a lot of very good examples, um, there's still that uh, hesitation to believe uh, believe these uh, pieces of evidence. The specific question here, sir, is can we maybe use real-time mass spectrometers like uh, FIGA, ROCIMS, or is this Figuero CMS to provide more direct evidence of airborne transmission or some instruments that you are more familiar with, at least for the transmission, Professor? Oh, that's, that's interesting. That's... <laughs> I, that, that's the kind of thing I do on, on my normal time is this real-time mass spectrometers. But um, I don't know that, I mean, um, it's not necessarily the best way because the, as I said, the virus, um, the virus is surrounded by mucin and by chlor sodium chloride, whatever. And the virus is a very small, it's a very small fraction of this aerosol. So a mass spectrometer, is going to detect the mucin, the, and it's going to have a hard time seeing that there is a virus. And if there is a virus, it's going to have a hard time seeing if it's this or that other virus or a bacteria or something like that. Um, I think this is where biology has, you know, things like PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, all these things can take a really small amount of virus and amplify it enormously, right? So there are machines that people are developing and, and selling, although I, I don't know how well they work, but if you have $30,000 that you don't know what to do with, you can buy one of these. And, um, and they will capture the aerosols and do PCR quickly and try to give you an alarm. I don't think it's ready and I think it's, it's too expensive, but that, that, I think that that has more promise, you know, than, than things like the mass spectrometers. And if I can say one other thing, I mean, the, um, I mean, something I, I, I have gotten to know some scientists in, in the Philippines that work in related fields as I do aerosols or things to do with air, they know as much as I do. You know, you don't need me to answer the questions. I've, I've given this particular webinar, but you can ask uh, Joshua Agar or, or, or other people and, and there, are, there are excellent scientists there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not, um, yeah, anyway. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for that. No, and, and I think the point is not really the technology can be a bit difficult to think about now, but again, when we stick to the principles, maybe it can, and with more ideas, we can come up with these uh, devices better. So, Professor, uh, maybe just as a medical professional also, it, this, is, this question is interesting to me um, in the sense that it's about um, your take on, is it possible that each person will produce slightly different sizes depending on a person's body build? like the length of the windpipe, the diameter, presence of phlegm, older people with decreased lung function or changes in structure. Um, if yes, would that mean then that some people may be more effective vehicles of transmission based on an individual's body characteristics or is that negligible? Thank you. Um, no, that's a, that's a very good question. And, and the um, different people differ by a factor of 10,000 in how many aerosols they produce. And then an individual person, if they're breathing or they're singing or yelling, can also differ by a very large factor, you know. And uh, it, I mean, I think they, this person already <laughs> probably is aware of the literature. All, all those factors play a role. Older people uh, tend to have their, their, basically some of the mechanisms that make aerosols is your airway collapse. And then when they reopen, it forms like a film, like a bubble. And then the bubble breaks and that, that makes aerosols, like the bubbles for children and things like that. So, yeah, it's very variable and it's not very well understood why. There are some studies that say maybe with more obesity, you have more, more emission, but, but it's not clear. And, it, and it, it's so variable in time and that, that is, is been difficult to study. But yeah, the, I mean, that's kind of when I said, some people are very infective. Some people are, are very little infective for COVID, for missiles and for other things. It has to do with those reasons, but we don't understand them very well. Thank you very much, Professor. And um, maybe just a bit of a break in the questions. Just a reminder to the participants that there's also an upvote uh, function of the Q&A Zoom webinar box. Uh, we would appreciate it if you can help us with upvoting questions that you really are interested in. Again, as we said, there are now, I think, 1,400 plus 
uh, participants here and we're still also getting questions from the different um, sources. So thank you very much for that. So please do upvote your questions um, and let's take advantage of uh, Professor Jimenez here. Sorry, sir, this is a figure of speech. Huh? Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, good day, Professor Jimenez. Just one more, uh, another question, sorry. Not, not one more, there are several, sir. Um, thank you for the very second presentation coming from a participant. Um, very specific. In slide 35, it was shown that the median COVID positive person can transmit weaker than a high COVID positive person in a closed room. Would this be additive, sir? Would chances of getting infected be higher if there are multiple median COVID positive persons in the same sized room as that shown in the data? Um, yeah, it will be additive if there is multiple people um, that are exhaling virus. But I think um, uh, uh, most of the infection, I mean, we know that 10 to 20% of the infected that infect 80 to 90% of the next generation. So we know it's disproportionately the people who are highly infective who are spreading the pandemic. And a lot of people, you know, like it often happens, people say, oh, the husband was infected, but the rest of the family didn't get infected at the home. And some people use that as an argument. It's not, it cannot be airborne because, because if they were airborne, everyone would have gotten infected. And what they are forgetting is that people are really, the, the amount of aerosols is 10,000 times, the amount of virus is 100,000 times different. So even larger than I showed. Now, so yeah, it's probably, yeah. Thank you again, Professor. And uh, my, my, the team is also reminding me to remind everybody that let's focus. Uh, I think we will prioritize questions for transmission primarily and maybe the risk of really contracting the virus in certain environments. The applications, again, uh, there's a part two for the webinar. And I think maybe uh, we will do this next week. And so you can reflect on the implications of these very good uh, principles that Professor Jimenez has been sharing. And if you have ideas, maybe we can start asking him about those ideas next week. But don't worry, just keep on asking your questions. We will document them as much as we can. And then we will ask those questions um, uh, next week. So Professor Jimenez is, uh, is getting a feel of what the questions are for the webinar. Okay. Sir, uh, this is a transmission um, question and also very practical one. What about traveling in an airplane, especially for immunocompromised persons? I think that's a more medical take, so maybe just a bit more about the principles. Is it safe? Are vent systems in place in planes? And what about the ventilation, sir, uh, in airplanes? Would you know something about that, sir? Yeah, I am. And again, I, I will touch on that in more detail next week, but basically, Modern airplanes, like you know, if you if you take a 737 or an Airbus 320, modern airplanes have very good ventilation systems. That said, there are still cases of transmission, but they tend to be the way the ventilation works is that the air is sucked to the side and filtered very quickly every couple of minutes. So when there is an outbreak in an airplane, it's normally the people next to next to the infected person or one row in front, one row in the back. But one of the outbreaks I showed that we had modeled and the model work was in an airplane, you know, but was at the beginning of COVID when they were not wearing masks. And, uh, and, this, and the person was coughing, you know, so that produces much more aerosols, you know. So in that particular case, so I would say they are not, the airplane itself when it's in the air, you know, it isn't, especially if, if people are wearing masks and you're wearing a good mask, it's not too bad. But you have to think that if you are traveling in an airplane, you, it's not just the airplane. You are going maybe in a taxi to the airport, to the terminal, to the waiting area. Then you're going in this bridge into the plane that doesn't have any ventilation. And then you go into the plane. And when you are boarding the plane, normally they don't turn on the ventilation. They turn on the ventilation when they turn on the engines or the stronger ventilation. You know? So there are all these periods, and I'll show some data next time in which you have, you know, poor ventilation, and then in the air, you have good ventilation, then you land, and then you have poor ventilation again. So you have to think about the whole trip. You know, I, I personally, I, I have chosen not to fly in any airplanes uh, since the pandemic started. Now, I have decided in April, I'm going to go see my family, so I will go, I will go in an airplane, but I, I will try to be careful. But, but uh, you know, that's, that's 
That's my take. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Jimenez. I think what's what's important there is again understanding these mechanisms enable us to do things. Um, of course, with the enabling restrictions, environment, and, and policy. So thank you very much for giving that uh, personal anecdote, sir. I appreciate that very much. Um, sir, this next question is uh, the highest upvoted so far in our webinar. And I think it's a reaction or born about a recent um, piece of Philippine news. I think this was yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll ask the question, sir. Um, hi, I work as an environment consult environmental consultant and my concern is about healthcare waste or infectious waste and the root of infection from these. Um, there has been recent news of children playing with improperly disposed waste who uh, were said to have also tested positive for COVID-19 and the questionnaire um, shared the link to that article, sir, if you want to read that um, later. Um, of course, infectious waste should be properly disposed of. I think there are no questions about that. But there is implication that the root of infections via blood or sharps or syringes or handling via fomites. Again, sir, uh, in your knowledge, has there been any evidence of transmission via wounds or pricks of COVID-19? Um, hmm, that's interesting. I mean, I see that that's a news article. I would say sometimes news articles say something and that's not necessarily what happened, right? It could be that they, I, I think it's definitely possible if, if there is waste and there was blood that had a high level of virus and they, I think it's definitely possible to transmit that way. Um, now, um, you know, if, if, if uh, we were gonna do research and, and to confirm it, we would say, okay, let's sequence the virus that's on the needles and let's sequence the virus in the kids. And then you can be more certain that really they got it that way because there is, you know, if these kids were playing together, it could be also that they got infected in some other way, right? Um, that's that's the problem, and that's that's kind of why really determining how they got infected is difficult. But yeah, I mean, I think in, in a situation like that, we should definitely treat it as as dangerous. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, when I, when I say that surfaces are very unlikely, I'm talking about surfaces in everyday life. You know, like if you really try to get infected through a surface, I'm sure you can. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Jimenez. And again, that's a very important distinction that you made. Um, you, you were mentioning about uh, the day-to-day -day high touch surfaces and all of those things. And then maybe to the rest of the people here in the webinar, that link, please follow that link because I think there are more details about that particular case. And uh, maybe the environmentalists here and the people with the, with the relevant expertise can come together and really say that, oh, well, there are many other problems also being raised by that particular article. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, okay, um, there are really a lot of questions. Okay, anyway, um, okay, this is very good. I think this might be better. This will be touched on uh, next week, I suppose, but I have to ask this now. Um, it, 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 it's very much something that you shared, sir. So maybe you can give more thoughts about this. Given that science is a continuous process of discovery, cumulative buildup of knowledge that often leads to updates and disproving of old knowledge, sir, how do we communicate to the general public that changes to guidelines should not be equated to hypocrisy? Or uh, given that a lot of people are more used to dogma or unchanging rules? Uh, and that's a very relevant question, I think, sir, especially in light of your presentation. How do we, how do we say that this is something that's okay? To change your mind or to actually change guidance is okay. Go ahead, sir. I mean, I think we, we have to be honest with the public. I mean, if when we are not honest with the public, at the end the public gets suspicious and then they don't trust you. And then if you don't trust the government, and then there is people saying, well, the vaccines don't work and whatever, whatever, and you don't trust the government who's the one saying that the vaccines work, you know. So I think. Honesty is the best policy. And I think, I mean, the first thing I will say next week is the most important thing is to tell people, you know, we thought it was going through surfaces and droplets, you know, that's what we thought, but we realized the pandemic has taught us that that was wrong, that those are less important and really is going through the air, you know, and and, and you tell people, and, and now that we understand that it goes through the air, these are the things you have to do, you know, it's, if, um, I mean, that's not what most governments are doing or WHO, basically they are, most maybe because they want to save face, they are doing the opposite. They are saying, 
you know, now you need to wear this other mask or like the US government here. Now they are like here in Boulder, the federal government, the county government, the city government, my university, they are all giving free N95 masks, but they are not telling you why. Nobody says, oh, because the virus is airborne. You know, so that then people are very confused. It's like, they don't tell me that anything is different, but now they're giving me the other mask. Do I need them? Why do I, you know? So I, I think you have to lead with the information. So it's the why, sir. You have to be able to explain, uh, as you mentioned earlier in your presentation. Okay. Sir, just another scientific question. Uh, if aerosols contain virions, and the virions are 60 to 80 nanometers in size, then how uh, do we know, or how did we know, how many virions are in a droplet? And are virions themselves ultrafine aerosols? Quite a technical question, sir. And then there's a second one. Are all droplets covered in part with mucin? Or do some only have saliva or liquid envelopes? And uh, yeah, yeah, that's the question, sir. Those are the, that's a two part question. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. So basically either saliva or respiratory fluid is mostly water. When it goes outside, the water dries and then these aerosols become 30% of the size they were, but, but the, the amount of water was 90% or something like that, but of the volume, but then you go to 30% of the size. And then if it's saliva is one composition, if it's respiratory fluid is another composition, but it's basically a little bit of virus with a lot of either the solids in the saliva and respiratory fluid and a little bit of water. Now, when people measure what comes out of people, I don't think you ever see a virus coming alone because the virus in your body there is no physical processes that are going to take that virus and put it alone in there. The, the processes are going to take a chunk of respiratory fluid where there is maybe a virus or two or three, as well as many other things. And that's what goes into the air, right? And that's why the respiratory aerosols are a lot larger than the virus, right? I think I, did I answer everything or was there one other? Uh, I, I think, sir, yes. Um, I think the... The one with, are, are all droplets covered in part with mucin? Not sure if you were able to uh, Yeah, I mean, I, every, every um, you, you don't have any aerosols that is just viruses themselves. Now, <laughs> now yes, one, other, one other thing that I didn't mention that, that is, is important, because sometimes people say, well, but the, the large droplet, the droplet spray, those droplets are much bigger. They have much more volume. Therefore, they should have many more viruses. But when you, when you do measurements, for any disease that measurements have been done, uh, you always see the same, that is the small aerosols that concentrate the pathogens. Okay? And it's thought that that has to do with the, the processes that generate the aerosols tend to put more of the viruses in the small aerosols and less viruses in the big droplets. Okay, so this favors also the, the aerosols even more. So I guess what I got there is um, maybe it's really about understanding that these things are a unit, not, not something that you can separate and then imagine that way. So very much the physics and the chemistry. And well, I, I'm enjoying the discussion so far, Professor Jimenez. I hope the, the participants are too. And um, please do uh, keep the questions coming in. Um, let me ask this one, sir. I loved what you said about let's lead first with the information. And I think um, people, when they have that, they can actually contextualize the advice better. So uh, I, I open with that because this one is, people will argue that this is something that's for the medical community to answer, but maybe it's something that's very real to this person. So um, this, there's somebody asking, because that person works for a death care or funeral home company. And uh, the person sometimes interacts with staff and crew that handle the crematory machine and the bodies. And sometimes there are positive cases. So far, the person is saying uh, they've read that risk is greater for living people than dead to living, but the person is still very much confused, sir. Um, would you be able to like, say something about how is the risk for dead bodies with regards to transmission to living persons? the living person to another living person. Thank you, sir. Um, hmm. um, dead bodies. I mean, I, again, I, I will be careful with someone who has just died of COVID. I, I would wear a good mask when handling that body or whatever now. Um, 
the virus doesn't stay alive uh, or infected for for very long. So I, I would say, and and that person is not breathing, is not doesn't have a way to produce aerosols or whatever. So I mean, I think is in that case is mostly about the surfaces, and you know maybe use gloves, wash your hands after handling that body or whatever. But it doesn't strike me as a high risk situation as long as you are careful, you know. Um, yeah, th thank you very much for that, sir. And uh, again, uh, another scientific question, I suppose, something that's a bit more theoretical, but again, thank you very much, Professor Jimenez. We lead with the information and then we help people contextualize it where they are. Um, sir, the question is uh, since, well, I suppose this is Delta specific in terms of variants, but maybe this is a variant general question. Since Delta has 150% to 300% more shed virus than the alpha variant, um, would not contagion increase even at a distance since viral load is higher in general? Yeah, I mean, um, as far as we know, all the variants transmit in the same way. All the variants are airborne. And in fact, it's almost a tenet of virology. There, there is no known pathogen that has changed the mode of transmission, right? It's just, it can be more or less contagious. And, I think with the new variants, um, there is more virus that's exhaled. The viral load can be higher also with Omicron. And also sometimes um, there is some speculation, maybe some data that uh, you need less viruses to get infected because they, they bind more strongly to the, to the receptors in the human body. You know, So it, it's not very well understood, but I think it's the, the answer is probably al along those things. And But now if you look at the... Um, the graph that I show, the factor of two is not a very big difference, you know, is the, uh, compared to the differences between people, you know, the, the median person is not very infective and you made them twice as infective, it's still not very infective. A person that can cause a super spreading event, you know, it's, it's still, you know, the, the differences between people and for one person during the disease, like when they just get infected at the peak of infection, which is normally before the symptoms, or, or just after the symptoms, or later on, that, that also changes enormously. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Professor Jimenez. What I got from there is uh, the variants still follow the physics and all of these uh, things that you explained. So basically, um, the actions should follow those, um, of course, and with, with, of course, a bit more context and nuance. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I'll just go ahead and ask this question, sir. Um, I know that next week it will be the more application, but again, we're talking about transmission here. Um, what about the barrier protection, sir? The, the face shields, the plexiglass barriers. Um, the question here is, uh, well, this is your, your take on it, sir. Do you think it was right to implement them? Um, any other thoughts? I know you've, you've gone about these things at length in many uh, other venues, but it's a question here. So let's ask, sir, go yes, ahead. Yeah. I mean, I think early on we didn't know, right? And, and um, I'm the first one that at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, when we, when we met with WHO, the experts, you know, who they were telling us they didn't believe it was airborne, and they told us to wash our hands fanatically because it was going through the surfaces. So for many months, I washed my hands fanatically and I disinfected surfaces. And you know, so early on, barriers made sense because of what what people thought the transmission was. But now, now that we understand a lot more that it is not these projectiles, but it's more like smoke. So you have to think about what the barriers do with smoke. There was some. Uh, a person in, in uh, here in the US was saying that they went to a restaurant and they had these barriers and she said, can I smoke? And they said, of course not. They said, well, if these barriers work, then I could smoke, <laughs> you know? So, because they, so I, I think that's a good example. So they, they help in one situation. Again, we'll, we'll talk more the next week. If you are talking close to someone, you know, you're talking close to someone and you are breathing their exhaled air, you are smelling the garlic on their, on their breath, you know? Then putting a barrier in between that breaks that jet of exhale there, it's a good idea. You know, so in a situation like a cashier, a teller, that kind of thing, it's a good idea. But now to put barriers everywhere in a classroom or in, in a meeting room or whatever, that starts to become a bad idea because you don't have so many jets, you know, in a classroom, 
people are facing, you know, you don't have anyone, you know, if you if you emit any droplets, they're gonna land in the back of the other person, they're not gonna get them infected, right? And when you put all these barriers, they make ventilation more difficult and they trap the air. And in the US, there was a study where they saw that schools that had put barriers, and there were many that did, had double the cases, double the transmission, right? So I would say that's they should be removed, you know. So so the, the lateral barriers, like in a classroom, they should be removed because they're getting more more children infected. Now the face shields, um, face shields are useful in a hospital or a situation like that, right? If you are a doctor or a nurse and a patient may cough on your face, you definitely want a face shield because there are projectiles. It's not that these droplets don't exist, it's just they're not very common, you know? Um, so definitely you, you want, or you could want a face shield. Now in society, when people are not coughing on your face, it doesn't really, help very much because they don't protect like an aerosols like the smoke they would go under or whatever and you will breathe it all the same and they cost money and they and it's one thing you have to keep track of and whatever so i would say instead of spending money on a face shield get a better mask get an a kn95 or an n95 and if you are in a really dangerous situation um you know like in a hospital or something i would say wear goggles you know some some glasses that are closed you know so that because we know there is infection through the eyes and you don't want the air to come in, you know, if you're in a hospital with poor ventilation, a situation like that, right? It's, it's thought that infection through the eyes is, is less important. So especially you need a good mask. Thank you very much for that. Again, Professor Jimenez, to me that context is really key. And again, the information that we have and the understanding really makes us make better decisions and action points. So thank you very much for that. Um, there's, I think, a very uh, well logical question given that uh, things that you've said earlier. Um, can there be a super spreader event in open air? And this is again just to balance that uh, that those questions and points earlier. Or do, do they only happen in enclosed areas? Or even with theoretically, sir, maybe you can weigh in on those. As as far as I know. Uh, I don't know of any scientific publication of a super spreading event outdoors. I have some colleagues, you know, that were saying maybe they have seen some, but they haven't published them, you know. Now, the situations they were describing, there were parties outdoors where people were partying all night, drinking and talking close to each other and talking to many different people. So I think if you have someone who's very infected, who's talking loud with loud music, and they talk to 25 different people, you could have a super spreading event outdoors and you could infect 20 of those, you know, but, and that wouldn't be, but that wouldn't be the sharing room air. That would be, you know, use close proximity once and again and again and again. So it's, it's not impossible, but I don't know of any cases. You know, there was one, one case here that they were saying that when, when President Trump got infected and a lot of people got infected in the White House, and they said maybe it was outdoors, but then later they told us, no, no, there were a lot of things that they did indoors and, and they, they didn't investigate it in detail, but I don't know of any outdoor super spreading. Again, it's like the thing outdoors, you know, if you're talking to someone outdoors very close without a mask, that's what's dangerous, you know? So again, sir, it's, uh, it's really about understanding how the virus gets transmitted in a particular environment. And I suppose, uh, I hope that people are getting that. It's not that we're saying do this already. It's really about uh, weighing the risks yourself. Professor Jimenez has been leading with the information. How do we now use it to help us um, act better during this pandemic? Thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, sir, the, these are again, similar questions. Um, what is the re recommended time of interaction to lower the risk for airborne transmission in an enclosed space with poor ventilation? And I suppose this is also um, related. Uh, assuming that ventilation is not improved, um, what is the residence time of the virus in an indoor area? And um, just another part of that question, sir, a viral fragment that's already inactive, uh, is that dangerous? So how long does that stay active? Would you have any information about that, sir? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, uh, how, how long the virus stays infective is not very clear, but what is clear is long enough, you know? And um, 
there are some, some studies that tell us maybe it's an hour, maybe it's a little more, a little less. There was one recent study that said, well, a lot of the infectivity is lost maybe in five or 10 minutes, but then it continues and flattens out and, and that has been controversial, I mean, you know. Um, but basically, I, I think, I, I don't know exactly what happens at the, at the beginning, that's the controversial part, but the fact that there is virus that survives for an hour or something like that is, uh, is clear, you know, otherwise you couldn't have the super spreading. Now, what happens to the virus? Someone excels the virus in a room, it's floating around. So the air eventually will go out, even if you're in a room that's poorly ventilated, there is always some infiltration of it. Otherwise we will like asphyxiate, you know, we will, we will run out of oxygen, right? People don't run out of oxygen indoors, you know, maybe stuffy, but so, so there is always some ventilation. So in an hour or two, it may go out. Then the virus loses infectivity, maybe in an hour, maybe a little faster, which is what I was referring to. And then the aerosols, even though, I mean, some of them may settle in minutes other other may settle in hours or in many hours, but eventually they will settle. So, you know, so what's really dangerous and really all the super spreading events are when people were in the same room at the same time for a long time and the room was poorly ventilated, you know? So one person is, imagine one person is exhaling this smoke and the other people in the same room breathing it immediately, you know? Or even these cases of long range transmission, like, like the hotel, the air, one person was exhaling and then the air was going under the door and the other people were inhaling it more or less at the same time without, you know, what, uh, what I think is nearly impossible is for example, there is someone infected in the office at 5 p.m. and now everyone leaves and you arrive at nine in the morning and now you inhale the virus and you, I think that's almost impossible, you know, because in, in so many hours, first the air has gone away, there wasn't any virus, it has lost infectivity. So it's really being at the same time in the same room, either being close to someone or being in the same time with the same room. How much time? As little as possible. You know, it's like, I, I will say next week, you need layers and it's like, yeah. the shorter you can make it, the better, you know, it's like, yeah. there, are, there are cases in which people, I mean, the, the CDC has published a case in which a prison guard got infected in one minute. I don't think that's very common, but it can happen, you know, okay. probably he was unlucky, he was talking to some uh, prisoner who was very highly infectious, you know, but I, I think the, the shorter the time, the better. It's nice that you're emphasizing that, sir, because I think no self-respecting person will actually try to try their chances with being infected with the virus. I and, and sorry, I have to say that because sometimes when people um, are given this information, there's a tendency for people to say, oh, so they'll try to do things that are weird. So let's just be very scared and limit information. But what I was getting from you is it's really about communicating very well these possibilities and probabilities and then trusting that the people can actually take care of themselves, of course, helped by good policy and all of these things. Thank you very much for that, Professor Jimenez. I really, really appreciate uh, the things that you've been saying <laughs> so far. Um, sir, uh, just a few, I, I think a few more questions. I think... Um, uh, to the team, sorry, I'm not really paying attention to the time. So kindly just give me a prompt and I'm just keep on asking these questions. There are still a lot. Uh, sir, about the applications, we're screening them, but maybe this is something that I think, uh, I'll ask this question first, sorry. Um, and I do droplets that already, that have already settled on surfaces have a risk of being aerosolized and be infectious. I suppose it's uh, something that's very logical to ask at this point. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, that is possible. And there was a paper um, maybe a year and a half ago from some colleagues where they showed for influenza with animals that this would happen. So they, they painted, I think it was hamsters with influenza virus. And then as, as they rubbed around this got aerosolized and they inhaled it, you know, in some, so th this is possible. I mean, at the end, they call that aerosolized fomites. So it starts on the surface and then it becomes an aerosol. The thing is, it's thought not to be very efficient because you know, once uh, an aerosol or a droplet is on a surface, it's not very easy to get it back in the air. You know, that's something you know, like in the airports, they want to do that 
to analyze for explosives and you have to have these big jets of air. So it's not easy for it to become aerosolized. And in any case, if it becomes aerosolized, the way to protect yourself is exactly the same. You're gonna inhale it and, and everything is the same. So I would say it's, it, you can consider as a side case of airborne, you know. And all, also remember that anything that's on a surface is gonna be losing infectivity, you know, also re relatively quickly in hours. Thank you very much for that, Professor Jimenez. That's something that's quite new to me and I, I would love to read that paper, sir. Thank you very much for that. And um, this, again, this question might be better for next week, but this early so that people can start reflecting on how we can do this better. Um, sir, are there countries right now in your knowledge that can serve as models in terms of the interdisciplinary approaches or committees to the pandemic response? And um, the next question is, have these countries generally fared better or worse than countries with um, a bit different, a uh, bit more limited representation in their decision-making committees and bodies? Go ahead, sir. Um, hmm. I mean, I think that how you do in the pandemic <laughs> depends on, on what the government and the society do. Not, I mean, sometimes you can have good committees, but if the government doesn't do what the committee says, um, or, you know, so I would say that there are countries clearly who have done better, you know. So for example, I mean, we know Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, China, New Zealand, um, have done a lot better. And then there is countries like, I think the US is probably the worst, you know, or I mean, or, or many, some other countries, right? Um, I think this varies a lot. I would say it's much more common that, uh, that things are very compartmentalized. And certainly was the case at the beginning of the pandemic that uh, like the attitude when we talked to WHO on the 3rd of April of 2020, I mean, the idea that we had something to tell them, it was, it was shocking to them. And they were, you know, the idea that these people who study aerosols had anything to contribute, like that person said that I quoted earlier, you know, it's, and, and that was the attitude in most places. You know, I tried to reach out to, you know, the people in Spain and the US and whatever they were, and most people were very resistant. I think, I think with time, you know, like Anthony Fauci, like I gave the example, has been more open-minded, but other parts of the CDC are less open-minded in the US. And I think in the WHO is the same. There is some, some top people we talk to that are more open-minded or, or there are still more close-minded. But some countries, I mean, I think, for example, Belgium is an interesting case because they have a person, someone who's kind of like a minister in charge of COVID, but he is not a politician and he is independent and he has the power to, to enact rules. And he, for example, so he made in Belgium, he made like CO2 monitors mandatory in restaurants or whatever, and he didn't have to have the approval of the government. You know, it was informed based on science and it, it varies a lot. I could, I could tell other cases, but um, th there are more bad cases than there are good cases. I actually keep on Twitter list of bad things that governments and countries are doing for everyone and of good things. And unfortunately, the bad list is three times as long as the good list, because just there are more governments doing bad things or, or poor mitigations. Thank you very much, Professor Jimenez. Um, before I, actually, the, the, the team is saying that we might be able to entertain a few people live. So we're trying to figure out how to do that very well. But maybe just because you led with that, Professor, um, I'll reframe this question that's in our Q&A. Um, you've been talking about how you've been advocating to um, decision makers. And um, <laughs> one of your Twitter series on the worst practices versus COVID has definitely ruffled a lot of feathers. Um, how, how would you say that this helped maybe um, open the, the door to more conversations outside of just social media? Um, do you really think that this is potentially a uh, um, space for people to, for the public to actually join the discourse? Uh, you were mentioning something about closed meetings and rooms and all of those things. So maybe, sir, a, a few thoughts about that 
I know that you said in your last tweet that you will not mention anything about that, but I, I think it, it has to be said. Um, in terms of the discourser, how do we use this particular um, relatively novel way of uh, people joining the decision making for them? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand, but let, let me. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry, let, sir. Let, let me let me reply what I think you ask. Um, sure, so sir. I, mean, I think the, the, the pandemic has brought us many annoying, painful, horrible things, right? But it has brought a few good things, right? And I think one of them is this error that was there in, in infectious disease. It has made it obvious. It has also made clear that the measures that we were told at the beginning of the pandemic don't work, right? Or don't work very well, you know, because we've been washing our hands and whatever, and in country after country, there is a new variant and you have a new wave, even though we wash our hands, right? So, so it's, it's made clear that you need to look for, that there is something that's not working, we need to look for answers somewhere else. And it has also made visible, you know, the, the, the science about airborne transmission, about aerosols, and, more people are listening, like you are listening. You know, imagine in 2019 there was a webinar about uh, about this. First, I wouldn't be the one giving it, but the, otherwise th there'll be probably 50 people in the Philippines who will be interested, right? Not not 1,400, you know. I mean, or or anywhere else, you know. So I think it's we have, but it is not a guarantee that this will leave, uh, you know. Um, like anything, once the virus goes down, anytime you know the cases go up and down, um, the interest of society or the journalists, whatever, goes up and down with it. And it's kind of like the like the tsunami of the Indian Ocean in 20, 2000 and whenever that was, right? That killed a lot of people, you know. And for a while there was a lot of research on tsunamis and tsunami warning systems and whatever. But then after a while, people lose interest. And, and I have friends who work on tsunamis and they say, yeah, but the government doesn't wanna pay for a tsunami detection system now because it's been a long time since we've been. So I think with the pandemic will be, now we are all still in the middle of it, but maybe five years from now, it's like, oh, forget about this painful thing. And then there is another virus that's, that appears. Is, it, is that, that next virus gonna be handled better and not cause a pandemic? I don't know. I think that depends on us. <laughs> you know, yes. it depends on what we do and what governments do. But also, you know, governments won't do not just the Philippines. Any government won't necessarily do the right thing by themselves. We have to poke yes, them. You know, we yes, have sir. to we have to inform them. We have to talk to the press. We have to talk to the people we know and try to influence policies so that the right thing is done. Is is not is not a guarantee. You know. Thank you very much, Professor Jimenez, and thank you for answering that question excellently. And I apologize for not being able to frame that well, but you answered it excellently, sir. I think that was a very good um, answer to that. Really, really appreciate that. Sir, we'll, we'll ask somebody to, we'll call somebody now to uh, ask their question live. Um, just looking for, okay, uh, sorry. May I call on uh, Mr. Mike Lester Perez, please? And um, as you are allowed to speak, can you introduce yourself and your institution before posing your question to Professor Jimenez? Thank you, Mike. Go ahead. Mike. Ah, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I think <laughs> the, the 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 pitfalls of doing this live, Professor. Sorry. Uh, we'll we'll try to get Mike back uh, on on the on the webinar. Um, the team is on it. I apologize for that, sir. Uh, okay. Um, may may I call on um, Miss Olga Bondal instead, and then we will uh, then entertain the question from uh, Miss Sinag. Uh, Amado, after Ma'am Olga asks her question. Go ahead, Ma'am Olga. Strike two for me. I hope strike three. <laughs> Sorry, Professor Jimenez. Uh, 
Well, one technical detail for people to be able to <laughs> go ahead, in, sir. A, you know, in a webinar, you need to promote them to panelists. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir, Professor Imens, for that. Um, Ma'am Sina, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Loud and clear. Po. Uh, okay. Hi, sir. Professor Jimenez. Um, I would like to ask if, um, for because I work in a theater, uh, particularly the UPFI Film Center, um, we have been closed since the, yeah, the, the lockdown in March 2020 um, because we... We have yet to uh, upgrade our like our ventilation system because this is a very old building. Um, for you, what is the like the minimum requirement for cinemas and theaters to really be COVID safe? Thank you very much. <laughs> so the I mean I would say for for theater, I would encourage you to doing outdoors whenever possible. That's always going to be a lot safer. If you want, okay. if you want to do it indoors. Um, is not a very, I mean, a, a movie theater is, is safer because the people who are talking are the ones in the screen and they are not, and, and the public is quiet. In a theater, the people who are talking, you know, if one of them is infected is, and is talking loudly, could be producing a lot of virus. So you want some ventilation. Ideally, you will have some kind of extractor that takes the air from the stage and, uh, and takes it away, you know. You, um, um, I think, anyway, the, the, as I will explain next time, one, one way to do it is you want to, you know, maybe limit the number of people, measure CO2, and then that's, that's one way that you can make sure your ventilation is okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rinpo. All right, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Okay, um, I've just been prompted that it's 9.57, Professor Jimenez, and um, unfortunately, uh, we have reached the end of not just the open forum, but we're now towards the end of the, um, the webinar. Um, if you have questions that we have not answered yet, or um, you want to join the discourse more, you may join our official Discord group chat, and the link is in the chat box that is being provided. There are also um, evaluation forums and question uh, and links to uh, a Google document for more questions for next week's webinar. We'll try our best to comb through your questions and the, do this better for everybody. Uh, the interest is really uh, so high, Professor Jimenez, and we're really very appreciative of you being here. And um, we're also, uh, we would like to emphasize that next week, it will be about now the practices and protection against COVID-19, given this information that Professor Jimenez has, has uh, so generously shared with us. And um, we are also reminding our attendees that you are already automatically registered for the second part of the webinar, and the same link will be used. Um, I was told that I'll be giving us a synthesis of, of everything that has happened, but it's hard to do moderating and synthesizing at the same time. But I, I do have a few points, if Professor Jimenez will and the rest of you will indulge me uh, just to kind of bookend this particular morning session. Um, thank you very much, Professor Jimenez. I think, or I believe personally, that um, the science is quite clear that COVID is indeed airborne. The virus floats in the air, and Professor Jimenez has so scientifically and eloquently told us how that happens, and it can be inhaled. And I think that has to be communicated better as uh, Professor Jimenez was himself said, we have to lead with the information so that we can explain how the virus is transmitted. And Professor Jimenez, let me just borrow your words that we cannot explain this effectively if we do not recognize history as context. And um, I think it's a very good reminder that um, history is a shared experience of people. And you yourself told us and remind us, reminded us that we need to not only listen to each other, not one discipline is better than the other. I think that's one of the key takeaways that I got from your sharing. But we need, actually, we need to work together. And so to the academics here, the health practitioners, the policymakers, the implementers, the leaders, the general public, 
we have to learn how to communicate better so that we can work together better so that ultimately people we and our countrymen and the rest of the world can actually be guided uh, supported and enabled to take back their lives from covid-19 and uh, sorry if that's not a uh, synthesis but it's really just a call to action and um, professor Jimenez, i really really would like to, um, on behalf of the team and the rest of the UP community and the rest of the people here, I'm pretty sure everybody's very grateful for the time that you've given us this morning. So um, that's it. But before we end the session, thank you very much to everybody. Um, Professor Jimenez, just a few words, if you have, just to, you know, if you want to yeah, also I mean, say something, final I, words, go ahead, sir. I, I, uh, I, a little later, but I see the top question and I didn't want to miss the chance to answer it from Nicolo Cabrera that he says. Oh, go ahead, sir. Do, do you feel medical professionals are more conservative than experts in other fields? We're trying to be skeptical of new ideas and new treatments that challenge medical conventions. And in our eyes, we are often more often proven right than wrong. But here with COVID, we are proven wrong. Um, you know, I would say, and I think it's, um, this is why I really want to address it. It's not, and I hope it came across, it's not that, you know, engineers or whatever are smarter than doctors, it's not, nothing to do with that. You know, it's like, it's human nature, you know. Uh, the, the engineers are the same, you know, it's like there is things that we are told and we think they are, they are right. And then later someone or, you know, in, in our science, someone discovers that it, it, it was. I mean, there was, I could tell you some cases that, people use this number for 40 years. And then someone went back and saw that that number was wrong. But all these aerosol scientists have been using the wrong number for 40 years. So, I mean, it's, it's just human nature. And it, it just so happened that in this pandemic, um, you know, the, the core of this issue is what we study. So for us, it was pretty transparent, but it's something that doctors don't study. And especially because they thought it was not important, they studied even less, you know. And, and I would say there is also a difference between practitioners and researchers. I think some medical researchers, like I showed uh, some of the people at Harvard or whatever, you know, have changed their mind. I think it's, it's different. A doctor that's treating patient every day and, and has to go more, uh, doesn't have time to be looking at the research or to be thinking like a researcher as much so anyway. But, but definitely I think we, we need to work together and it's not about who's smarter or or anything like that, you know, I think it's, we really, I mean, I really enjoy working with doctors and virologists and whatever, and we need more of that, not, not less. And I, you know, for those of you, I think it's, it's good that this webinar is, is uh, encouraging even there is co-organized and co-sponsored by medicine and engineering and different things. And, and even history, as you said, so anyway, that was one, one thing. And, then, and the only other thing is just, uh, thanks very much for the invitation and, and, and for the chance and for the, for the patients with, uh, with my explanations that sometimes are not very clear, but hopefully, hopefully it was useful uh, all the time you, you spent here with me. Thank you very much, Professor Jimenez, for going there. That needed to be said. And um, I re personally, I really appreciate that as somebody who's an advocate of intersectorality. Thank you very much. And um, again, We'll end the webinar, part one. It was, it was an amazing time, sir. It's really a privilege to be here. Um, before we end the session, just a reminder, just some housekeeping. The certificates of attendance will be given after attending both sessions of the webinars. And we really uh, would like to request everyone to attend both sessions so that the evaluation forms can also be accomplished well so that we can do this better and maybe start doing this regularly. It's something that's an amazing effort. So. Thank you very much. And again, Professor Jimenez, thank you for highlighting that. Um, these are the partner institutions actually that came together to, uh, to, to make this event a success. We would like to thank our partner institutions and organizers, the UP Open University, the UP Diliman College of Science, the UP Diliman College of Engineering, the UP Diliman Institute of Civil Engineering, the UP Los Baños Graduate School, the UP Manila College of Medicine, the UP Manila Community Health and Development Program, the UP Manila College of Nursing, the UP Baguio Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, the UP Diliman Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and the UP Los Baños Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. And uh, truly it has, again, sorry for repeating that, but to me, I'm quite overwhelmed by that. It really has been a privilege 
And that ends our first session of hashtag COVID is airborne, understanding and implementing the paradigm shift. Um, this has been Dr. Paolo Victor Medina. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week, Tuesday, February 8th, same time, same link for the second part of our webinar. See you, everybody. God bless and take care. Professor Jimenez, thank you very much again. Uh -huh.